Hi, my name is Peter, and this is Go Verba Noun. So, last time, Hank Green talked to us about business and ethics and the role that they have played in the online education scene for him. In this video, he's going to talk to us a little bit about the Nerdfighteria census, what went into it, and what came out of it. So, let's check it out. What inspired the Nerdfighteria census? Uh, it's the first census we did was two years ago. What brought it on? I, I'm... Every business in the world studies their consumers. And then I, I realized like not only was it an opportunity for us to do that, but it would also be an opportunity for us to share that. So like mostly like you do these demographic customer things and they're highly confidential because you don't want your competition to benefit from this $400,000 market research thing that you just did. Um, not that that's how much the census costs, but I have friends who work in market research and I know how much it costs. The census doesn't cost anything, by the way, because I write it and then I analyze it and uh, we have volunteers who help analyze it, but it's just a, a fun thing. It was also an opportunity for the audience to get to know itself better because then like, I can make this video where I go through 100,000 humans who have answered this thing and I like the, cu the, the cumulative 100,000 humans kind of people are you like where do you live and like and to understand that you're part of a diverse community that like you know there is no age demographic that makes up 50 percent or more like there's no majorities in, in nerd fighter except unfortunately racially but there are like it's a huge bisection of like countries and that, that the tale of countries goes on and on forever and like we have people who watch us in over 100 countries and and then like what are those people into really diverse things and like and also understanding that like for me the like the things that people are passionate about are so far beyond of course just nerd fighteria but also like things that i even know about you know like and i like i love looking through these things and like we, we ask a question that's just like what are you super into right now and and like going through and being like well there's a thing i've never heard of and googling it and being like oh that is an adorable anime about this dog who also is a samurai warrior or something um <laughs> and that's uh so that's really cool yeah the, i mean the motivation was just to know as a creator you're always imagining your audience and like that's an important part of being a creator you want to know how they're going to respond to this and, and like what they're into and, and what excites them and how to make things that people are going to like. And, you know, a big, huge part of that is internal. Like you think, what would I like? And that's an important part of it for me. It's probably, you know, the biggest piece of the pie. It's like, I want to make something that I'm going to like. There's also the piece of the pie that's like, what's John going to like? Because I'm still thinking about him as like the, the next biggest piece of my audience. But then the majority of it are all these other people. And like, what do they want? What are they interested in? And I think you get a skewed view of that if you just look at comments. And you get a skewed view of it if you just look at Twitter or Instagram. Those things are demographically selected. Um, like my Instagram, for example, is very clearly a younger audience than my YouTube channel. Um, I'm sure it would be even younger if I were on Vine, but I'm not. My Tumblr is where I do like the majority of my actual interaction with people, but I'm aware that the, that Tumblr is somewhat demographically selected. So like the people who are on Tumblr are not the same group of people who, as the people who watch our YouTube videos. So I wanted to actually know that it's still doing a little bit of self-selection because it's still just the people who answer the survey who care enough to answer. But really, those are the people I care about. The people who care enough to spend a half an hour responding to a survey are by far the most important part of our audience. And the, you know, and the 150,000 people who don't care enough to answer the survey, eh, like, I hope they keep watching. But, <laughs> but um, they're obviously not super into it. So like, eh, you know, like, that's not as important to me. So to get this information about the people who really care about what we do and about, and who like maybe identify as a nerd fighter and like consider this a part of who they are as a person, like just to know those things is really valuable and I have encouraged other creators to do it and I'm having good feedback from other YouTubers who are interested in, in it. Really, the unexpected things about the census, the biggest unexpected thing about the census is how many people fill it out. But deeper than that is why so many people fill it out. And that's because they feel as if they're doing a favor for the community. 
Like they're doing a thing for this thing that is important to them. And it, that's absolutely true. They absolutely are. And <laughs> it's great to see uh, people, like their excitement and enthusiasm manifesting itself in that way. And like, not, like I just didn't anticipate that that would be an effect of the, of the census, but it really is. Is there anything that's been a direct result of the Nerd Vitaria census? Subbable, the entire idea and concept of subbable. We asked people on the first census, how much would you pay if you had to pay for Crash Course? And we recognized this wasn't going to reflect reality, but if you took all the dollar amounts that people said that they would pay per month, it was ludicrous. It was like $700,000 per month. And so we were like, okay, so we need to do that. We need to give them an opportunity to, to pay. Um, we're not going to make them pay. Because the question was, if you had to pay, how much would you pay? So we didn't want to make anybody, we didn't want to make people pay. But if $700,000 a month of potential value, taking even a fraction of that, which it turned out to be a substantial fraction, but like, but still. So yeah, that subable was a direct effect of the Nerd Vitaria census. Nice. Nice. Um, but other examples, um, we've found YouTube channels that that we really like and didn't know about and have promoted through the census. In terms of events, which this is, you know, this is all head, this is all like idea space right now, but I'm really into the idea of creating real life spaces for online communities. Obviously like VidCon is a manifestation of that, but like, but moving beyond VidCon, I'm really excited about bringing other online communities into the real world. So like finding out what nerd fighters are into and like how else they're identifying um, and what what they're enthusiastic about is very helpful for for that as well. Like there's big, you know, there's big uh, interesting things happening on YouTube around beauty and gaming and books and like all these different things. And so finding out that like for example, this is only surprising because I don't watch a lot of beauty content, but um, a surprising number of nerd fighters watch beauty creators. I would not have guessed that, but only because I am a man who has never put on makeup and. Like, so knowing that is very helpful if we're ever going to, you know, help that world have its, have an event or assist those people who, you know, are making great content and doing cool things. There's a, there's like direct effects and then there's just like internalization of information and like knowing things about your audience that you didn't know before. I'm always fascinated to find out how many people found Vlogbrothers through SciShow and Crash Course because to me it's a one-way street. Vlogbrothers is the thing that makes SciShow and Crash Course possible. But now that SciShow and Crash Course have their own very large independent audiences, it's really interesting to see people moving the other direction too. Um, I never anticipated that, which is a dumb thing. Like, of course that would happen. But here I am. Has Subbable done what you thought it would do? I thought Subbable was going to do a bunch of different things. Maybe. Um, it has done the most important of them, which is to fund SciShow and Crash Course and a couple of other... YouTube shows. And without that, it would have been very difficult to make the transition off of Google's money because SciShow and Crash Course were funded by Google for two years. So to leave that behind was terrifying. <laughs> um, but uh, Subbable made it possible for us to do that and also even have a little extra. So, and also Google forgave us some of our debt, which was nice. Uh, so thanks to everyone involved in making that possible. It was a lot of different pieces that, that had to come together for, for us to keep doing these things, and we can, and we are, and yay. Um, so it, is, it has done that thing. You know, there was also this little piece of me that thought maybe Subbable was going to be a place where people actually went to get content, but ugh, that's too complicated. It is so hard to get people to go to a new place, and like, there's the, the, the system functions okay now. At the time, there was a lot of like being up in arms about the state of YouTube's uh, distribution system. For example, I don't get the majority of the people I subscribe to. They don't show up on the front page of my YouTube like they used to. So I thought, well, let's solve that problem. But really, YouTube knows what it's doing. It knows why it's only showing you a select and select creators, and uh, that's not as huge of a problem as people anticipated. So more broadly, what I wanted was for there to be a way to economically incentivize people to create content that isn't about getting the most number of views. Because that's, if you're, if advertising is how you're making money, it's just about impressions. You know, there's, 
some engagement metrics that matter, but mostly it's about impressions. I wanted to incentivize the creation of content that maybe not everybody, but some people really love and just need to exist. Like they want it to be in the world and that's the whole, like, and to create a system for that kind of content that people are just extremely enthusiastic about, for that kind of content to exist rather than the content that we currently have existing, which is fine, but is less exciting to me. And those systems already exist. So to create an, a new economic system to incentivize the creation of content that people are very enthusiastic about, that was a huge goal of Subbable. And it has worked in a limited fashion so far, but I see it as being very... Like a, like a definite, significant, impactful like future. And Patreon is part of that. Different other subscription services that require you to pay are also part of that. Kickstarter is part of that. And like this whole movement toward people getting together and creating enough money for a thing that they want to exist to exist. You know, Veronica Mars and Crash Course and like, and you know, that cooler that has a USB port and a blender attachment, like those things, like that people want to be in the world. And it's just, if you want to pay for it, then pay for it. Like if you want it to exist, it's up to us. It's not up to some investors. It's not up to, you know, whether or not we can get 2 million people an episode to watch this. Cause that's not every, like it's not every piece of content. There's a lot of stuff that's gonna be made that 2 million people just never will care enough about, but that's still important because even if it's 10,000 people, but it's creating 10 times more value for those 10,000 people, then yay, like then that's a success. And I think that educational content in particular very clearly provides more value per minute watched than entertainment. Not that educational content can't be entertaining, but when you're being like, you know, if this is gonna help you do well on your GREs, if this is gonna help you pass your chemistry test, like, and then get into a better school and then have a better life, <laughs> like, it's, it's like significantly more valuable than like a very entertaining cat video. Even the most entertaining cat video. <laughs> and now a bonus question. What role do you think does curiosity play in the learning process? I think that all of the best learning is based in curiosity. And I think that we've lost that a lot in education. And I don't know why that is, and I don't know how to solve that problem, but I think that, I think that most people would agree with that statement. And honestly, like, the thing that we do to foster curiosity is just be curious and like, express how exciting that is. Not just for six-year-olds, which seems to be the majority of like, where curiosity is in our culture but among everyone because like it's it's the it's a it's the greatest thing you know like it's it's what all of human progress is based on like that's crazy i think that if you just make it clear that like being excited about knowing um you know i think that it's inside like that thing is inside of everyone and i think that if you express it then people are like, oh, it's okay to express that. It's okay to feel that. That's the main thing you have to do. So that's what we try to do. In case you were curious, that last question about curiosity, ha, came from Dr. Lindsay Doe of Sexplanations. Thank you, Lindsay, for an awesome question. And thank you, Hank, for an awesome answer. I think by now, you can probably see why it's so valuable to have data in the first place, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now, supposing you had access to hundreds of thousands of people who were actively engaged in the online education community, what kind of questions would you ask? Let me know in the comments down below or on the social medium of your choice. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, whatever. As always, thank you for watching and thank you for caring. And until next time, guys, I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye.